our servitude will be of no advantage to us. The words of Judith. Judith is a fascinating book from the Apocrypha. Yes, it was in Luther's Bible. He preached sermons on this and Tobit. You won't find it very often used in the lectionary, but as you know by now, Pastor Gorlitz is an oddball, and he will sometimes put these in there. Judith has the one problem of being agreed upon by the early church as being absolutely historical. But the place names are given, that are given are not in the exact time frame of when the book takes place, meaning somewhere someone hand copying it updated it with the modern names. Besides that, it's a fascinating glimpse at a particular time of history in Israel during a brief period of time, because there were only a few, that they were being faithful to the Lord and his covenant, but they were still being attacked by the Assyrians and the people were panic stricken. Everybody was running with fear. Everybody was wanting to bow down and surrender. And Judith, a young, beautiful widow, begins to shame the man of Israel by giving these fabulous speeches about how they need to take courage have heart and fight back. Trust in the Lord. They think there's something advantageous to surrendering. And she keeps reminding them that there is not. A few months ago, we had the later reading on a Wednesday night from Judith, where she chops off the head of the general of the invading army, one of my personal favorites. Brings the head back to the encampment of Israel and says to shame the men. See, this is what happens when you actually fight back. This remains a lasting lesson for Christians today, for Christians of all time. We think very often that our servitude will save us. And look what it has gotten us. For centuries now, in order to prove that we're nice instead of kind, we've kept our mouths shut about things that go on in our culture. We've learned to be really, really polite to our pagan neighbors, to our pagan teachers. We have voted for pagan politicians for crying out loud because they paid lip service to Christmas or some other such. We have bit by bit surrendered in the face of the overwhelming pressure of the culture because darn it, we would much rather be liked. And the truth is, to whatever degree that we hold on to the word of God, if we hold on to it at all, we will never be liked by the world. The unbelieving world will never approve of us because the word of God does not approve of the things we do in our unbelief. Our God loves us enough to tell us when we're wrong, to tell us when we're evil, to tell us we need to repent. He loves us enough to die in our place on a cross and continually bathe us in his grace for the things that we do. The thing he will not abide is dishonesty. It was not me, it was the woman you made. It was the snake. It was totally someone else's fault that we fell in the garden, Lord. I was born this way. I had no choice. Whatever our excuse, whatever we infuse into it, God will not have it. The truth is we were made in perfection a perfection in the Garden of Eden that you and I were not born into. We were born into the curse, a world that has fallen from the garden. That means we're born with all manner of defects, congenital, health, physiological, moral, and ethical. Paul warns us in the Bible, in the New Testament, that we will continue to grow worse. Despite all of that, none of it is an excuse. At no point can we turn to the Lord and say, oh, I was born this way, when his law has told us right from wrong and said, forgiveness is there if we repent and return to him. Just because we desire something does not mean we have to do it. For crying out loud, I shouldn't have to preach that from a pulpit in the 21st century. And yet, like a world populated only by kindergartners, who need their mother to tell them they can't have the cookie before dinner. We imagine that somehow, oh, oops, I fornicated. Whoops, I did drugs. Oops, I stole. Oh, I accidentally murdered somebody. 
God isn't buying it, and neither should we. We give ourselves over to the servitude to sin, servitude to false ideologies and beliefs in the world. We give ourselves over to slavery, to Satan, sin, death, and the devil, because we want to. That's why we took the cookie before dinner, Mom. It's why we do all manner of evil, because we choose to give in to our lusts, our drives, and imagine that we don't have a choice. The very definition of what makes one a responsible adult human being on this planet is having control over your choices, of being able to know when to discipline yourself. If you don't know when to keep your mouth shut, you won't keep a job. If you don't know when to obey the law, you won't stay out of jail. And yet we imagine that somehow God should just ignore the fact that we are wicked, evil sinners, that everyone in the world should reassure and affirm each other constantly in whatever fake identity they just made up. We imagine that all of that is okay because it pleases our wicked flesh and our rebellious spirit. It gratifies us emotionally doing all those things that we should know by our experience as biological entities in the world. Appetites that when they are fed are not good for us. The hangovers, the after effects, the diseases, the suffering, the things that come with it are not good. You'd think it would be simple to figure out, but we are sinful people. We will always have excuses and a plethora of them. This is why Jesus comes into the world to die for the sins of the cosmos. He knows that we cannot save ourselves by our works. He knows that we cannot choose to love him. We are so helpless and powerless. We are so weakened and frail. We are so completely ensnared by the devil that until his word intrudes into our lives, until his Holy Ghost begins to work on us, until the truth that was in us before the fall can be reinserted in us by this well springing up to eternal life in baptism, in the word, and in the Eucharist, without those things to draw us to him, to ensnare us to himself, to make us his servants, we would be lost. But this is the feast of the Virgin Mary, and I haven't preached on her yet, which would be a very unseemly, unLutheran seeming thing to do. In fact, probably through most of the synod, they're not observing Mary's feast day today on a Sunday. What I love about the story of the women in the Bible is that all of it symbolizes the work of the Lord through his church and faith. Elizabeth is pregnant in her old age with John the Baptist. Mary has become pregnant with our Lord and Savior. This great meeting between the two of them, it is a whole changing of an era, the fulfillment of the old covenant, the beginning of a new testament. Like Sarah, millennia before her, Elizabeth is pregnant with a child of the promise in her old age. But it will be John, the last of the Old Testament prophets, he will live long enough to see the Christ, to know that the promise is fulfilled, but he will not live to see the crucifixion and resurrection. Her baby John will die in Old Testament prophets martyrdom, waiting for the fulfillment of all things. And here they meet the miraculous cousins, the one who announces the way in the spirit of Elijah, the Lord is coming. And Mary, there's actually two Marys, well, there's several, but Mary Magdalene is symbolic of the church herself, the church that finds us as we are, miserable, wretched sinners, prostituting ourselves to the things of the world, Satan, our sin, and false gods. Jesus finds Mary Magdalene and makes her whole. He heals her of all the wretched sickness that clings to her because of the diseased way she's been existing rather than living. She is the church, found in the world, redeemed and made whole by Jesus, made holy and sanctified. And the Virgin Mary symbolizes the church in its purity, triumphant. Oh, not that she was without sin, of course, but she's the other side of this coin for us from Mary Magdalene before her repentance. When we meet the Virgin Mary, she's a believer. She believes the promises told her and continues to believe them despite the fact that she is a sinner like us, in this womb, God Almighty deigns to dwell. This moment when Mary, Elizabeth, 
and soon Mary Magdalene with them and at the empty tomb. This moment that brings together all of cosmic history. The promise that God made in the garden that a descendant of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. The God who was willing because he loved us to see Moses in the cave and in the burning bush, to dwell in the Ark of the Covenant that prefigures the womb of the Blessed Virgin, that God has come into the world and died for the sins of it, to set it free. Many writers write the Bible over thousands of years inspired by the Holy Ghost, but the fingerprint of God is seen in the things that are done and repeat themselves, the things that are promised and fulfilled that the Israelites should be told to make a box and put in it the word of God and the staff of the high priest and a jar of the miraculous bread from heaven, to put the angels on top and to come to the empty tomb and find the slab like on top of the ark with an angel in each end, the fulfillment of the atonement, the mercy seat, all the things promised having come to fruition. God had them build a box in the wilderness thousands of years ago because it points to the womb, it points to the tomb, and therefore it points to the empty tomb. You and I will find nothing by servitude to the world. The more we cave into the world, the more we turn away from the Lord. The promise of the Lord is this, inevitable victory, not here, not by weapons or mean-spirited means, not by politics or by money, our victory isn't here in this world. It comes in the new creation. It is guaranteed by eternity and by the resurrection. By the promises of the resurrection of the dead and the new kingdom to come, an entire new creation, there is literally nothing in this world that we should be afraid of. Nothing that can shred the flesh off of our bones in agony and burn us to death can be anything more than temporary. Compared to what awaits, it is nothing. It is spiritual cowardice to fear that and relent and buckle under, conform, and go the way of the world willfully because we're afraid. Gosh, we're afraid that our neighbor won't like us. And for something as trivial as that, we would peddle away a chance to preach, to share, to bear witness to the truth. But knowing our frailty, knowing our weakness, across this millennia of his work, our Lord Jesus Christ, God and man, comes into the flesh to cancel out our debt of sin and bestow all of this grace through his church that is symbolized by the women and symbolized then in the feminine. The bridegroom comes and delivers his goods, the absolution and the blessings, the sacrament of the altar continually refreshing us with his word and his gospel, we, the bride, the church, infused with all of this glorious goodness that he has won and delivered to us in Jesus' name. Amen.